Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Before I go any further, I'd like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of the channel. Nat, Dova, Edith, Tammy, Luz, Colt, Denise, Samantha, Stephanie, Corpse Lover, Norma DW, Cindy, and Patty's niece. Thank you all so much for your continued support of the channel. I greatly appreciate it. If you are new here, or you have been here already, and you enjoy what you are listening to, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help this channel immensely, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 21. Right after this intro, an ad will play, or read the first story an ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. The Disappearance of Kyle Hancock Early Life Kyle Hancock was born in 1989. According to his personal Facebook account, he attended Parkside Collegiate Institute and has been employed by Format Industries since 2021. The St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada native appears to enjoy playing guitar and spending time outdoors, with him sharing several photos of himself fishing and kayaking disappearance. The exact date Kyle was last seen hasn't been confirmed. With reports bearing between August 1st and 2nd of 2023, what is known is that he was last sighted in St. Thomas. Since he went missing, Kyle's bank account hasn't been accessed, nor has his phone been active, with investigators noting a lack of connectivity to any network investigation. Very little information has been publicly shared regarding the investigation into Kyle's disappearance. The St. Thomas Police Service first published a media release about the case on September 27, 2023, with a second update shared on November 13. It's reported that several unfounded leads have been followed up on. On November 6, 2023, Investigators received a call from farmer Bill Walters, who came across Kyle's e-bike while harvesting crops from a field in the area of Southdale Line and Centennial Avenue in St. Thomas. One of the tires was flat, and the wires connecting the battery were hanging loose. This prompted a search of the field, and Walters postponed his farm work. A few days later, Walter again uncovered an item belonging to Kyle. This time, it was his helmet. This prompted an additional search, which located the missing man's cell phone in a field at the corner of Southdale Line and Fairview Avenue, approximately two kilometers away. Searches of the surrounding area where the three items were found were aided by a search and rescue team from nearby London, Ontario. While the St. Thomas Police Service handles the official investigation, Kyle's family has been conducting their own search. They've visited men's mission in nearby communities and have put up missing persons posters. Case Contact Information Kyle Hancock described as a 34-year-old white male with a thin bill, standing at 6 foot and weighing 157 pounds. He has short brown hair and blue eyes, his ears are pierced, and he has the word Dodge and the car company's logo tattooed on his upper right arm. At this point, investigators don't suspect foul play in the case. Anyone with information regarding Kyle's whereabouts is asked to contact the St. Thomas Police Service at 519-631-1224. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477.
coal train Carlos. Discovery. On November 11, 1995, the frozen body of an unidentified man was found in a coal train car in Wright, Campbell County, Wyoming. The train had traveled from the Pruitt Power Plant in Richmond, Texas, some 1,000 miles away, and had made a number of stops before arriving in Wyoming. It's believed John Doe could have hopped on the train at any point during the seven to 10 day journey. Autopsy. Given the circumstances, no autopsy was ordered on the decedent. While this date of death is unknown, the cause was deemed to be hypothermia, given the cold temperatures and a lack of trauma to the body. John Doe's remains were cremated and interred on Mount Pigsgah Cemetery in Gilead on November 30, 1995, under a gravestone marked Unknown Man. Investigation The original Campbell County Sheriff's Office report stated drag marks were found at the scene, indicating John Doe had climbed into the train car. However, several details show this to be unlikely, such as his height. He was just over 5 feet tall, and the cars were upwards of 12 feet tall. Other evidence also suggests he tried and failed to jump from the other train car. In 2015, Campbell County Coroner Laura Sundstrom reopened the case. One of her first investigative avenues was to look for the train's manifest to figure out where it stopped on its way to Wyoming. Unfortunately, the archives only go back to 1996. Details John Doe is described as a 40 to 50 year old man of white or Cuban descent. He stood between 5 foot 1 and 5 foot 2 and weighed approximately around 150 to 160 pounds. He had graying black hair on his scalp, black chest hair, and a black beard and mustache and brown eyes. He had a blood acetone concentration of 17%, which is consistent of individuals with diabetes. The decedent had a number of distinguishing marks, including three tattoos. Karadat, written unevenly on his upper left arm and shoulder, Cubano on his left hand, and a cross on the web of his right hand, and a 14-centimeter scar on his left hip. It's believed this could have been the result of another surgery or an accident. John Doe wasn't overly dirty and had recently shaved underneath his beard. He was found wearing a short sleeve purple button-down shirt brown pants held up by a brown belt that had Malorian engraved on it. Undergarments, light-colored socks, yellow Cuban heel loafers, a watch, and a silver-colored pinky ring. A green Mexican blanket vest was found draped over his head, and he had on him three keys and a lighter. Regarding the lighter, it's believed the descendant may have been a smoker, given cigarette butts were found at the scene. They also indicate he'd been at the location for a decent period of time. Contact case information. John Doe's fingerprints were taken when he was found, but they were later lost, as were his belongings once they were turned over to the Wilson Nectar Funeral Home. He was unfortunately cremated before DNA testing or dental charts could be done. Anyone with information regarding the decedent's identity is asked to contact the Campbell County Sheriff's Office at 307-682-7271 or the Campbell County Coroner's Office at 307-687-6179. The Disappearance of Emily Bailey Early Life Emily Bailey was born in December of 1998 as a fourth of five siblings. She was close to her mother, Lori Bevan, and her older brother, Ben Bailey, with whom she shared many private jokes and kept in constant contact with. Growing up, Emily moved between neighborhoods in East and Central Hamilton, Ontario, 
and attended four elementary schools between junior kindergarten and grade eight. While she attended Hill Park Secondary School as a teenager, she reportedly missed most of her classes, having become friends with a group of students who weren't necessarily the best people to hang out with. During this time, she continued to move around a lot, spending a few years in Brampton and struggled with depression. According to relatives and friends, Emily was full of personality and incredibly outgoing. While she may have struggled later in life, she was, at heart, a good person who made friends everywhere she went, as her sense of humor was contagious. As she entered adulthood, Emily began to struggle with drug addiction and homelessness, which she tried to hide from her family out of fear they'd reject her. She managed to get clean twice, both times when she was pregnant, but found herself sucked back into that world once she had given birth. Given this lifestyle, Emily often found herself sleeping in tents or couch surfing. Not the sort of environment you'd want to raise children in, her two daughters, Harper and Kinsley. They lived with their grandparents. Emily was determined to make a change and was putting a plan in place to get clean, find employment and counseling and get her girls back. In the fall of 2021, Emily began seeing a man named Jeffrey, or Jeff for short, Johnson, a friend's brother-in-law. The relationship was described as rocky by friends, who also revealed to the media that Emily soon got pregnant. The then 23-year-old also began to change. Once an avid poster on social media, by that December, she had stopped posting entirely. Disappearance. The days before Emily's disappearance saw her spending time with friends. On the evening of Christmas, she was with a close friend. She again visited the same person three days later to dye her hair and have dinner. On December 31st, 2021, she and Jeff visited her friend Nikki. The trio hung out until 10.30 p.m., at which point the couple got into a cab to return to Jeff's house. According to the driver, he and Emily were dropped off at the residence on Weir Street North, near Barton Street East and Kenilworth Avenue North. Emily had told Nikki they were attending a party, but many believe it was just the pair drinking at the house. She'd also reportedly messaged several people that day, inquiring about getting a ride somewhere. After Emily's disappearance, Brandon Hunter, her ex-boyfriend and the father of one of her daughters, claimed to have spoken to Jeff, who told him that the couple had gotten into an argument at some point that night. Emily left the house, but Jeff didn't say where she'd went. At 2.39 a.m. the next morning, Brandon just so happened to send his ex a message on Facebook, which marked the last time Emily opened one from anyone. It's reported that the last time Emily was seen was between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. on January 1st, 2022, on Weir Street. She hasn't been seen or heard from since. It took about a week and a half for the 23-year-old to be reported missing when she fell to attend a scheduled visit with one of her daughters. Brandon called the police on January 10th, 2022, after being unable to get a hold of her. Given she was in constant contact with her loved ones, this was seen as very out of character for Emily. The search. Police attempted to search Jeff's residence on the day Emily was reported missing, but he refused to let officers in, claiming he had COVID-19 and had just had hand surgery. He claimed the injury happened while he was sharpening a chainsaw on either January 2nd or 3rd of 2022. Given Jeff was the last person to see Emily alive, investigators conducted searches at properties he has ties to, including the house via a search warrant and a milling property in Dunville, Ontario. Forensic testing was done at the residence and nothing was reportedly found at the latter location. 
Emily's family has been active in the search from early on, putting up missing persons posters, holding rallies, and creating a dedicated Facebook group. They even contacted the organization Please Bring Me Home to see if its members would assist. While they did at first, the group paused their searches after speaking with the Hamilton Police Service, who stated the investigation was active. Please Bring Me Home tends to focus on cold cases. Two months into the investigation, in March of 2022, it was announced the case had been turned over to the Hamilton Police Service's homicide unit, with investigators stating that, based on the evidence, they believed Emily was murdered and her body disposed of. They also revealed they were looking for information about the owner of a dark or black GMC or Chevrolet pickup truck that Emily may have been connected to a week before her disappearance. Jeff owned a truck matching this description, which had been impounded in November of 2021. He then borrowed a relative's truck, which was also black. The latter was searched, but nothing of any significance was found. In April of 2022, police posted a media release to dispel rumors that Emily's disappearance and presumed murder occurred at the hands of a serial killer targeting tattooed women in Hamilton and the surrounding area. The theory emerged after a post was shared to social media suggesting a connection between Emily's case and that of a 33-year-old Stacy Raspberry who went missing in February 2022 in the Nigeria region. Investigators said there was no evidence the cases were connected, nor was there a serial killer on the loose. Over a year later, in May of 2023, an image was posted to Emily's TikTok account, which hadn't been active since before she went missing. It was a photograph of a dog and featured a 15-second clip of 5050's song, Cupid. Investigators believe the account was hacked and said they planned to reach out to TikTok. In July of 2023, Hamilton's police board approved $20,000 as a reward for information leading to the location of Emily's remains and the conviction of those responsible for her disappearance. By this point, more than 30 witnesses had been interviewed, several search warrants executed, and searches conducted within and outside of Hamilton. Despite these efforts, little evidence has been uncovered, with investigators saying they're running out of investigative avenues. Emily's DNA and information has since been uploaded into a national database. Investigators say there are people out there who know what happened, but they refuse to come forward. Details. Emily Bailey was last seen on Weir Street in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on January 1st, 2022. She was 23 years old and was wearing a yellow Billabong brand hoodie and a long black winter coat. She was also carrying a light blue backpack with black handles. Emily is described as a white female who would today be 25 years old. She stands around 5'3 and 5'4 and weighs approximately 100 to 134 pounds. At the time of her disappearance, she had shoulder length black or brown hair with tie dyed green highlights and her eyes are brown. The missing woman has two tattoos, an elephant on her left forearm and the Batman's symbol on the outside of her right forearm. Case Contact Information Emily's disappearance is currently being investigated as a homicide, given the high possibility of foul play. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Hamilton Police Service at either 905 546 2963 or 905 546 4863. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1 800 222 8477.
the disappearance of Rebecca Louisa Guno. Early life. Rebecca Louisa Becky Guno was born on May 25th of 1960 in Northwest British Columbia. A member of the Nisgaya Nation, she grew up with her father, a logger who struggled with alcoholism, and her two older brothers. Her younger sisters lived with their aunt. As a child, Rebecca and her brothers were sent to residential school. At 17, she gave birth to a son who was raised by a relative. Her second child died shortly after birth, suffering a crib death. Rebecca moved to Vancouver's downtown east side in the early 1980s, where she was involved in the sex trade and became addicted to drugs. Despite her personal struggles, she's remembered for being bubbly and happy. Disappearance. On June 22, 1983, Rebecca took a city bus to Vancouver's downtown east side with a female friend with a plan being to meet up with friends for drinks at the Lone Star Hotel on Corral Street. At least that's what she told her common law husband. In actuality, she planned to meet up with a friend named Josh. Rebecca was reported missing in the Vancouver Police Department three days later, on June 25, 1983. She's one of several women to vanish within a 10-block area of the downtown east side with many confirmed to be victims of Canadian serial killer Robert Picton. Rebecca is believed to be one of his victims, although her remains have not been located. Investigation Rebecca's wallet was found several blocks from her residence following her disappearance. The exact date is unknown other than it was well after she'd been reported missing. The case file has been investigated on three separate occasions without any unusable leads. The man known as Josh has never been located. In October of 2023, the RCMP highlighted Rebecca's disappearance as part of its 10-week MMWIG campaign. Details. Rebecca Louisa Guno went missing from Vancouver's downtown east side on June 22, 1983. She was just 23 years old, and at the time of her disappearance, was wearing brown boots, glasses, and a white wool sweater. She's described as having a medium build, standing at 4 foot 11 inches, and weighing 130 pounds. She had long, straight black hair and brown eyes. Case Contact Information Rebecca's case is currently classified as endangered missing with homicide suspected. Anyone with information regarding the investigation is asked to contact the Vancouver Police Department at 604-717-3321 or 304-717-2530. Or the Vancouver's Missing Women's Tip Line at 1-877-687-3377. Tips can also be called in anonymously at Crime Stoppers 604-662-8477 or 1-800-222-8477. Disappearance of Misty Potts Early Life Misty Potts was born in Edmonton, Alberta in 1977 and grew up on the Alexis Nakoda Sioux First Nation, about 70 kilometers away. Her family, including brothers Zachary and Percy Jr. and sister Eva, was raised very traditional with their father being a hunter and their mother a gatherer. Their father, in particular, made sure the girls knew their worth. According to Eva, Misty was funny, kind, smart, and selfless, with a compassionate heart. She loved her community and was committed to sharing and preserving her culture. After graduating from Onaway High School, Misty left home to attend the University of Manitoba. 
she received her Bachelor of Arts in 2002 and, eight years later, earned her Master's in Environmental Studies. Her thesis discussed the implications of the oil and gas industry on Canada's indigenous population. Around this time, Misty helped with the documentary film Awakening Spirit, which looked at how industrialization impacts First Nation communities. This was followed by a teaching stint at Yellowed Tribal College in Edmonton and worked on a number of other environmental-related projects. Misty's life was going well with her giving birth to a son named Gabriel and moving back to Manitoba. She'd also planned to pursue her PhD part-time at Athabasca University in Alberta. Unfortunately, in 2011, Zachary died by suicide, an event that was followed by Misty and her husband separating. The latter got custody of their son. All this led Misty to begin using marijuana, which itself turned into prescription drug and methamphetamine use. Knowing she needed to separate herself from the situation, she moved back home to Alberta, and with the support of her mother and Eva, began seeking help for her substance abuse issues. Despite this, her sister believes she was spending time with other drug users. Disappearance. The last time anyone from Misty's immediate family spoke to or saw her was on February 24, 2015. Along with talking to Eva, she called Gabriel and visited the convenience store with her mother, with whom she was staying. While at the store, she ran into some friends. Misty was last active on Facebook on March 7, 2015, when she sent a message to her niece. Approximately one week later, on either the 13th, 14th, or 16th of March, sources vary, the 37-year-old was last seen standing alongside the road at the intersection of highways 43 and 765. The location was only a short distance from her mother's house. After two weeks of no contact, her family officially reported Misty missing to the RCMP on March 30, 2015. While she would appear for a week or two at a time, it was uncommon for them to not receive a phone call or message on social media. Investigation The Mayor Thorpe Detachment of the RCMP is currently handling the case. Eva was quick to criticize investigators claiming they didn't take the case seriously during the first two weeks due to Missy's history with illicit substances. To get the case in the public eye, Eva launched her own ground searches, conducted media interviews, and organized round dances within the community. The family have also looked into tips on their own, traveling as far as Edmonton, Eva's since said that she believes her sister is dead and that Misty's disappearance is likely related to her drug use. The RCMP has conducted ground searches in the area where Misty was last seen, and investigators have reached out to detachments in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and British Columbia, as the missing woman has ties to all three provinces. Details. Misty Faith Potts discovered from the Alexa Nakoda Sioux First Nation in Alberta in mid-March 2015. She was 37 years old at the time and was last seen at the intersection of highways 43 and 765, with the assumption being that she'd walk the short distance home. Misty is described as having a medium build standing at 5 foot 6 inches to 5 foot 7 inches tall and weighing between 120 to 130 pounds. The RCMP states she weighed upwards of 170. She had dark brown eyes, black shoulder length hair, and a freckled face. At the time of her disappearance, she was wearing a red jacket, coral colored jeans, and thick black rimmed prescription glasses. According to the RCMP, Misty may have traveled to Edmonton or British Columbia's Lower Mainland. She also has ties to Manitoba. 
case contact information. Anyone with information regarding the Misty Potts' case is asked to contact the Mayor Thorpe Detachment of the RCMP at either 780-786-2800 or 780-786-2291. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. The Disappearance of Leah Roberts Early Life Leah Roberts was born on July 23, 1976, to Nancy and Stancil Roberts. The youngest of three children, she was raised in Durham, North Carolina. While Leah had a relatively normal childhood, things took a turn at 17 when her father was diagnosed with a life-threatening respiratory disease. Three years later, her mother died unexpectedly of heart disease. Leah, a sophomore at North Carolina State University, took some time off to be with her family before returning in the fall of 1998. Not long after returning to school, Leah was involved in a near-fatal car accident when a transport truck turned out in front of her. She suffered a punctured lung and a shattered femur, for which she had a metal rod placed in her leg. Her survival was a life-changing moment for the young woman who viewed it as her second chance. While attending North Carolina State University, Leah played soccer and did a semester in Spain. She also signed up for a field study program in Costa Rica when, once again, tragedy struck. In 1999, after years of dealing with his condition, Stancil passed away. While upset, Leah decided to continue with her trip to the Caribbean, and it was an experience that completely changed her worldview. She became interested in life's adventure and wanted to see the world. She began writing poetry and keeping a journal and ultimately decided to leave school just six months before she was slated to graduate with a degree with Spanish and anthropology. Upon leaving school, Leah, an already private person, drew away from her core friend group and began learning to play the guitar and practice photography. She also adopted a kitten. Disappearance On the morning of March 9, 2000, Leah received a phone call from her sister, Kara, who asked how she was doing. At 11 a.m., she also confirmed plans with her roommate, Nicole Weeks, for a babysitting job the following day. When Leah didn't show up to babysit, Nicole didn't think much of it, given their conflicting schedules. It wasn't uncommon for them to go a day or two without seeing each other. However, she began to grow worried by March 12th, prompted in part by calls from friends looking to get in touch with Leah. She called Kara around noon that day, and the pair spent the next 24 hours calling everyone who knew Leah to no avail. On March 13th, Leah's friends met Kara and Nicole at her residence. Kara searched her sister's room and determined that she left voluntarily, given the items that were missing, including her new kitten, B. Despite the assumption, she still reported Leah missing to the Raleigh Police Department, given her sister's mental and emotional state. Kara returned to the home the following day to double check that she hadn't overlooked anything. It was during the second search that she came across a note Leah had left for Nicole. With it, she'd left enough money to cover a month's worth of bills, and while it was largely cryptic, the letter had a happy tone. Leah also used the opportunity to make reference to Jake Kerouac's book, On the Road. This jogs Nicole's memory with the missing woman's roommate recalling a conversation they had about a cross-country road trip. This brought to mind another Kerouac book, Dharma Burns, which is set in Whatcom County, Washington. Curious as to where her sister had traveled, Kara began looking into Leah's bank records. 
She'd been given power of attorney when Leah went to Costa Rica. She'd withdrawn 3000 in cash around 6 p.m. on March 9th, with there being a motel charge in Memphis, Tennessee the following day. Additional spending showed Leah had driven west along I-40 until she hit California, at which time she headed north on I-5. Her last noted transaction was at shortly after midnight on March 13th at a gas station in Brooks, Oregon. While Kara was examining Leah's financial records, Nicole and her friends began canvassing the area. They came across a woman who regularly talked with Leah at the Cup of Joe coffee house. She revealed that the missing woman had been discussing her desire to visit Desolation Peak in Whatcom County, Washington, the exact location mentioned in Dharma Burns. On March 18th, a local man and his wife were going for an early morning run in Mount Baker, Snoqualmie National Forest in Washington when they came across a crashed vehicle. The white Jeep Cherokee was found along Canyon Creek Road, 30 miles east of Bellingham. The man called 911. When deputies arrived on the scene, they felt something was suspicious, but also considered the vehicle could have been abandoned by a drunk driver, as was somewhat common for the area. However, upon further examination, they found the broken windows of the Jeep had been covered with towels and cloths, indicating someone had been staying in it. They also located a number of belongings, including a passport, checkbook, guitar, driver's license, and CDs. Given the Jeep had a North Carolina license plate, the authorities in that state were called, at which point it was discovered that the vehicle was linked to Leah's missing persons report. Officers left a note at Kara's residence asking that she contact the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office. It was then that she learned that Leah was truly missing. Investigation Upon learning about the crash, the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office sent officers to the scene. An investigation of the site showed Leah's Jeep Cherokee had been traveling between 30 to 40 miles per hour when it went off-road, meaning whoever was within it at the time, or should, have been severely injured. However, no signs were found to show that anyone was injured, nor were there any footprints leaving the scene. On March 21, 2000, Kara and her brother Heath traveled to Bellingham, Washington, to begin their search into Leah's disappearance. Upon being brought to the area, and where her Jeep was found, they began to wonder if she'd maybe hit her head and wandered away. But no area hospitals had records of treating an injured or disoriented woman. While sifting through the items in the vehicle, investigators found no signs of Leah's kitten, but they did locate a keepsake box. Within it was a movie ticket stub for the film American Beauty, at the theater in Bellis Fair Mall in Bellingham. It was timestamped 2.10 p.m. on March 13, 2000. No one remembered seeing Leah at the theater, but Kara did visit the sit-down restaurant at the mall, where two patrons recalled seeing her. One said she was open and kind, while the other said they chatted about Jack Kerouac and her reasons for being in Washington. He told investigators that Leah left with a man known as Only Barry and provided a description. This, however, went against the account of the first individual, who said the missing woman had left the restaurant alone. As missing persons flyers were put up across Bellingham, investigators and agents with the FBI began to properly process Leah's car. They came across a pair of pants with $2,400 in the pockets, meaning she only spent $100 of her $2,500 she'd arrived in the area with. As well, they came across her mother's engagement ring under a floorboard. As Leah rarely took it off, this led the police to theorize that she'd been intentionally harmed. Approximately one week after the Jeep was discovered, an anonymous man called in to say that he and his wife 
may have run into Leah at a Texaco gas station in Everett, Washington, shortly after it's believed the vehicle was abandoned. He said she appeared to be disoriented and wasn't aware of her own identity. Unfortunately, he ended the call before investigators could ask him for additional details. It's believed the sighting is valid, with the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office assuming the man panicked during the call for unknown reasons. Within two weeks of the Jeep's discovery, searches began of Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. Beginning on Canyon Creek Road, an area was mapped out based on how far an injured person could travel on foot, after which dogs, ground personnel, and helicopters were brought in. Nothing was found, leading investigators to theorize that Leah either wasn't in the vehicle when it crashed or that she wasn't hurt during the incident. While this search was occurring, officers contacted the gas station in Brooks, Oregon that Leah had last visited before she went missing. Surveillance footage from within was collected, showing her by herself. However, she kept peering out the door while waiting for the clerk to ring in her purchase. Unfortunately, there are no cameras pointed outside, meaning no one knows who or what Leah was looking at. In 2005, volunteers from a North Carolina-based missing persons awareness group organized a caravan across the United States to raise awareness about several cases, including Leah's. The following year, investigators re-examined the Jeep to see if anything had been overlooked. The hood was popped open, and along with fingerprints, signs were found to show tampering. The starter relay had had its wire cut, allowing the vehicle to accelerate without a driver behind the wheel. The tampering was like done by a mechanic or someone with knowledge of cars. This brought officers back to the second man from the restaurant, who was in the military and had had experience as a mechanic. He'd since moved to Canada meaning investigators had to contact Canadian authorities to obtain his fingerprints and DNA. The fingerprints were a dead end, and no updates had been provided regarding whether his DNA was a match to that found on Leah's belongings. Details Leah Toby Roberts went missing from Whitcomb County, Washington in mid-March 2000. She was 23 years old at the time and driving a white 1993 Jeep Cherokee, North Carolina license plate, JVP2881. When she disappeared, Leah was 5 foot 6 inches in height and weighed 130 pounds. She had sandy blonde hair and blue eyes and was last known to be wearing several pieces of jewelry. A 14 karat gold earrings with 0.3 carat ruby stones and three rings on her right hand, including a 14 carat white gold ring set with a 0.45 carat emerald cut diamond flanked by two 0.07 carat baguette diamonds. Leah has a number of distinguishable features, including dimples, a surgical scar on her right hip, and a beauty mark above the upper right corner of her lip. The same surgery that caused the scar on her hip also resulted in a metal rod being placed in her leg. This would have a unique serial number. Other notable details about Leah are that she has a strong southern accent, is a vegetarian, she smokes cigarettes, and speaks fluid Spanish. Case Contact Information Leah's case is currently classified as Endangered Missing. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office at either 360-676-6650 or 360-778-6600 or 360-778-6760. The Sheriff's Office can also be contacted via its dispatch center at 360-676-6711 or its tip line at 360-778-6663.
The death of Tina Fontaine. Early life. Tina Fontaine was born on January 1st, 1999 to Valentina Duck and Eugene Fontaine. Both struggled growing up, with Eugene suffering the ill effects of Canada's residential school system. At 12 years old, he left his home in Manitoba's Sagakeen First Nation and moved to Winnipeg, where he lived on the street and struggled with drug and alcohol abuse. Valentina was born and raised in the Blood Vein First Nation, north of Winnipeg. When she was six years old, she was removed from her home by Manitoba Child and Family Services, the start of repeated removals until she was made a permanent ward of the state when she was only 10. Once in the care of CFS, Valentina began to rebel, running away and using drugs and alcohol. She met Eugene when she was 12 years old and he 23. CFS records show social workers were aware of the relationship and Eugene's history of violence. In spring of 1996, Valentina gave birth to the couple's first child, a boy, who was immediately taken into CFS custody. Tina was born three years later. This time around, the couple was allowed to keep their child as they'd taken steps to better their lives and break free of their struggles with drugs and alcohol. They'd also been attending parenting classes. Tina's little sister, Sarah, was born a year later. It was around this time the pair were removed from their parents' care after Valentina and Eugene left them with their granddaughter and didn't return. The children were given back four days later, but no assessment was done to determine if their parents could properly care for them. The pair were seized again the following year after their parents were seen leaving a house party intoxicated with them in tow. They were housed in a hotel before being placed in the foster care system. Eugene and Valentina broke up not long after and following the completion of parenting courses and addiction treatment, the children were returned to Eugene's custody. In 2004, Eugene was diagnosed with cancer, prompting him to request that the children's great aunt and uncle, Thelma and Joseph Favel, take them in. Thelma was granted permanent custody soon after, and Tina and Sarah lived at her home in Sagkeen First Nation for over a decade. On October 31, 2011, Eugene was beaten to death by two individuals after a three-day alcohol and drug binge. While the men eventually pled guilty to the charges of manslaughter, Eugene's death greatly affected Tina. Thelma attempted to get her counseling through CFS, but it failed to arrange any services for her. Following Eugene's death, Tina started acting up in school missing assignments, smoking marijuana, and skipping class. She also got into verbal and physical confrontations and received medical treatment for self-harm. During this time, Thelma continued to request help from CFS, but her calls for help went unanswered. Before her father's death, Tina was your average preteen. She enjoyed school and was always looking out for those who were bullied. She also went out of her way to take care of the younger children on the reserve. Lead up to disappearance. On November 1st, 2013, Tina ran away to West Valentina in Winnipeg. Child welfare workers located her and placed her in a shelter before returning her to Thelma's care. Still reeling from her father's death, Tina paid tribute to him on her 15th birthday by getting a tattoo. The piece placed between her shoulder blades featured Eugene's name and his birth and death dates between a pair of angel wings. Following her visit to Winnipeg the previous year, Tina begged Thelma to allow her to visit Valentina again. Knowing she had a history of working in the sex trade, Thelma placed a call to Valentina's caseworkers to make sure it was safe for Tina and allowed the visit. After Tina was discovered deceased, CFS claimed to have had no record of this interaction occurring. Things grew worse for Tina when she began to write a victim impact statement in regards to her father's death. 
Her worsening behavior and mental health prompted Thelma to request in April 2014 that her niece be placed in the care of CFS. A worker met with the 15-year-old on May 5, 2014, and a month later, Tina was referred to counseling services in Winnipeg and Beausejour. However, transportation issues prevented her from accessing these resources. Thelma allowed Tina and her sister to visit Valentina at the end of June of 2014. This time around, she didn't check into her lifestyle, meaning she was unaware that since Tina's last visit, Valentina had lost custody of her children and was back on the streets. On June 30th, Thelma's daughter and son volunteered to drive the pair to Winnipeg, each with some money and a calling card. While Sarah ended up returning home with Samantha and Brian, Tina stayed. According to Sarah, Tina texted her numerous photos during her time in Winnipeg, which showed her doing drugs and with bruises all over her body. The latter were the result of Valentina and her boyfriend beating her. Disappearance Tina didn't return to Sag King First Nation, and Thelma placed her in the care of Manitoba Child and Family Services. From July 17 through the 18th, 2014, she was placed in an area hotel, but ran away and later told a social worker she was staying at a local group home. According to Valentina, her daughter only stayed with her a few times, the last of which was July 22nd. Tina's aunt, Lena, later told police she'd stayed with her over the August long weekend. From July 23rd to the 29th, Tina stayed at the Dinaway Youth Resource Center. On July 27th, she was reported missing by a shelter employee after missing curfew. While she returned the next afternoon, she missed curfew again on July 30th, prompting the shelter to give away her bed. For the second time, she was reported missing to the Winnipeg Police Service. On August 5th, Tina called a CFS worker and was picked up. On August 6th, she made a phone call to 911, saying a friend by the name of Sebastian, real name Raymond Gormier, had stolen a pickup truck. The dispatcher told her to call a different number and Tina disconnected. A police report from August 8th places Tina in downtown Winnipeg. At 5.15 a.m. that morning, two officers spoke to her during a traffic stop on Isabel Street, an area known for prostitution. They first noticed the vehicle she was in, a black pickup truck, while patrolling the Spence neighborhood. They tried to approach it after seeing it stop near Ellis Avenue and Furby Street, but the driver sped away. When they caught up with the vehicle, the driver was taken into custody for driving with a suspended license. Tina was spoken to and initially refused to give them her real name. She eventually revealed her identity and her name was run through the system. While she was still considered missing in the Winnipeg Police Services database, the officers claimed the system didn't flag her. One of the officers asked where she was staying, to which Tina responded, the Quest Inn on Ellis Avenue. After declining a ride to the location, she was let go. Later, the two officers involved in the traffic stop were reassigned while an internal investigation occurred into the interaction. Five hours later, Tina was found passed out in the parking lot behind the Helen Better Osborne Center on Ellis Avenue by a University of Winnipeg security guard. Paramedics were called and she was transported to the Health Sciences Center, Children's Hospital. While drowsy, she didn't appear to have suffered any injuries. However, blood tests showed her blood alcohol content was 0 0.09, while urine tests showed traces of alcohol, cannabinoids, and cocaine in her system. When confronted about this, she admitted to have drunk three beers and taken gabapentin, also known on the street as Gabby's, the previous night. When questioned about being sexually exploited, she refused to answer any questions or undergo a physical exam. 
Tina's CFS worker met with her at the hospital and took her to McDonald's before driving her to the Best Western Charter House Hotel. During the drive, the young girl confided in the worker that she and her boyfriend, Cody, had been hanging out with a much older man by the name of Sebastian, who'd promised to find her a bicycle. Concerned, the worker told Tina that CFS could buy her a bike if she just stayed in their care. But she refused, saying she needed to meet friends at Portage Place. In an interview with CBC News, following Tina's death, an 18-year-old named Katrina helped fill in the blanks surrounding Tina's hospitalization. According to Katrina, she met Tina at about a... According to Katrina, she'd met Tina between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. on August 7th and, fearing her friend was drunk, took her to the McDonald Youth Services, Youth Resource Center, and Emergency Shelter for food and a place to sleep. However, Tina refused to stay and wouldn't provide employees with her name. An hour later, Katrina saw Tina jump into a truck with a group of unknown men. Concerned, she flagged down a passing police cruiser whose officers stopped the vehicle and set Tina free. The next time Katrina saw Tina, it was about 8 p.m. on August 8th after she'd left the Best Western Charter House Hotel. After informing Katrina of her day, the two hung out until 3 a.m. the next morning when a man approached them on Ellis Avenue and offered Tina money to perform a sexual act. The young girl accepted and left with the unknown individual, and while Katrina tried to follow the duo, she lost sight of them in the darkness. Later that day, August 9th, Tina was once again reported missing. According to Sarah, this was around the time she received her final text from Tina, which was directed toward Thelma and Joseph. In it, she'd said, Tell Mama and Papa I love them and miss them but I'm not ready to go home. Death. On August 17, 2014, Tina Fontaine's body was found wrapped in plastic in a duvet cover in the Red River near the Alexander Docks. It was discovered while divers were searching for another indigenous person, Farron Hall, who was seen struggling in the water near the forks. He too would be found deceased. According to investigators, Tina's body had been weighed down in the water with rocks, and due to the level of decomposition, it took four hours for them to determine the remains were that of a young female. She was later identified as the missing 15-year-old by the tattoo on her back. Tina's cause of death could not be determined, but due to the circumstances was deemed a homicide. There were also signs of sexual assault. A toxicology report showed she had a significant amount of marijuana in her system and that her blood alcohol level was 0 .099. However, the toxologist didn't believe them to have contributed to her death and noted the levels may have registered artificially high due to composition and the fact that the tests were conducted on chest cavity fluid as opposed to blood. Tina was buried on the Sag King First Nation next to her father. On the first anniversary of her death, a memorial was placed on the gravesite. Investigation. Investigators went door to door in Winnipeg's West End, as that was the last location that could place Tina. They specifically focused on Ellis Avenue, Langside Street, and Furby Street as well as the area around Portage Place, asking if anyone had noticed anything suspicious. The duvet Tina was found wrapped in was a point of interest for investigators, who launched an effort to locate its owner. They soon learned it was only sold at Costco and that 800 had been purchased in the Winnipeg area. Of course, only 100 people cooperated while others said they'd since donated or gotten rid of theirs. On October 1, 2014, Raymond Cornier was arrested after investigators received a tip. At the time, he was already a suspect in Tina's case and had other outstanding warrants, 
He tried to evade arrest, but was caught and brought in for interrogation. When asked why he ran, he stated he didn't want to go to jail. When questioned about Tina, Cornier claimed to have only known her for a few weeks. He said they'd met around five or six times, and that the last time he saw her was days before her body was found. He explained that Tina had come to the house he was staying at, crying over Cody returning home to his home in St. Teresa Point. She left after learning Cornier had sold her bicycle for two grams of marijuana. He followed her down Glenwood Crescent, at which point they got into an argument. Cornier claimed that as they were walking, he noticed a man across the street whom he described as white with long hair, similar to Robert Plant. According to Cornier, he learned of Tina's death from the news. Following their interaction with Cornier, investigators launched Project Styx. It ran from June to December of 2015 and involved numerous undercover officers who wore recording devices and engaged him in 62 scenarios designed to elicit information about Tina's death. In order to get close to Cornier, they also arranged for him to live in an apartment at 400 Logan Avenue, which was also bugged. The recordings obtained during this period played a key part in the Crown's case. A number of them featured Cornier speaking to different individuals about Tina and her death. While he never admitted to killing the 15-year-old, he did make several incriminating statements. July 2015. In an interaction with an unidentified female, he had said, 15-year-old girl. Fuck. I drew the line, and that's why she got killed. She got killed. I'll make you a bet. She got killed because we found out. I found out she was 15 years old. August 2015. While using drugs with a group of unknown individuals, he said, don't overdose here because then your body's going to be wrapped up in a fucking carpet and thrown in the river. November 2015. In one of the last recordings, Corner is heard talking to himself. You think you'll get the murder out of me? Hmm. That's fucking it, man. Get away from me. Get away from me. Project Styx culminated in a sting operation in British Columbia, after which Cornier was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. He pleaded not guilty to the charge. Trail Cornier's trial began on January 29, 2018. The Crown's case was largely circumstantial, as investigators had been unable to uncover any forensic evidence connecting him to Tina. They argued Cornier killed Tina because he wished to have sex with her, and when he found out she wasn't 18, he killed her because he didn't want to be known as a pedophile. This was based on the recordings produced during Project Styx along with witnesses' testimony that placed Cornier and Tina together in the days leading up to her death. The jury also heard testimony from witnesses who'd seen Cornier with the same type of duvet found wrapped around Tina's body. Two police officers with the Winnipeg Police Service testified that Ida Beardy, who'd allowed Cornier to live in a tent in her backyard, had positively identified the duvet as his, as had her daughter. The defense challenged the Crown's evidence, saying their case was built on interference made from the recordings, which, for the most part, was hard to decipher. They argued that the statements made on them could not be verified by just listening to the audio, and pointed out that Cornier never outwardly admitted to killing Tina. Cornier's lawyers also brought up the unreliability of witness testimony and that a cause of death hadn't been determined, meaning the jury couldn't say with certainty that Tina had died of an unlawful act. As such, it was argued Cornier be acquitted on that alone. On February 22, 2018, after 13 hours of deliberation, the jury of seven women and four men acquitted Cornier of any involvement in Tina's death. Less than a month later, on March 13, 2018,
prosecutors announced they wouldn't be appealing the decision. In an interview with CBC in March 2019, Rainier admitted to giving Tina marijuana but denied sexually exploiting or killing her. Aftermath Tina's death increased the spotlight on Canada's missing and murdered indigenous women. It prompted a renewed call for a national inquiry led by the Canadian Human Rights Commission. In the direct aftermath of her death, more than 1,000 people took to the streets and dozens camped outside the Manitoba legislature for weeks, demanding the government take a closer look at the cases. Winnipeg's mayor called for Canadians to confront the shame and tragedy of racism while indigenous leaders petitioned for change. This led the province, under the leadership of Premier Brian Pallister, to pledge an end to the marginalization of indigenous women and prompted the federal government to launch the national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women. Since Tina's death, Katrina had begun working with girls she meets on the streets, writing down the license plates of the vehicles they get into in case anything were to happen to them. She said she felt a lot of guilt in the months following Tina's death, but has since managed to move on. As Tina was being cared for by Child and Family Services, her case was reviewed by Manitoba's Office of the Children's Advocate. An internal investigation was launched into how she managed to slip through the cracks, and on June 1, 2015, CFS announced it would no longer be placing children in hotels. The case has prompted the creation of numerous volunteer groups within Winnipeg. One, known as Drag the Red, regularly drags the Red River for bodies or evidence in open missing persons or homicide cases. Another is the Bear Clan Patrol, which promotes safety and crime prevention in the city's north end. Speaking about his decision to form the group, organizer James Favell said, When we first started out, it was in the wake of Tina Fontaine's murder, her ultimate demise, the disrespect that was shown to her personhood, was the last straw for me, my family, and my community at large. Tina's death led the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs to form the First Nations Family Advocate Office. There was also the creation of the strong-hearted Buffalo Women's Crisis Stabilization Unit, a semi-secure crisis intervention program for indigenous women at risk of sexual exploitation. In March of 2018, the Manitoba government announced it would not call for a public inquiry into Tina's death. This sparked immediate backlash from both indigenous leaders and the province's opposition parties. Federal funding allowed the Indianawe Youth Resource Center to rename itself Tina's Safe Haven and launch a safe space for youth, which is open 24-7. In March of 2021, Raymond Cornier was arrested in Ottawa, Ontario for allegedly breaking into mail and storage rooms, apartments, and parking garages at four different complexes. It's unknown how long he'd been residing in the city, but at the time of his arrest, he was staying at a local homeless shelter. Case Contact Information Those with information regarding the death of Tina Fontaine are asked to contact the Winnipeg Police Service at 204-986-6508 or Crime Stoppers at 204-786-8477. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 21. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these selections. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. 
Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.